Hi, and welcome to another episode of Nexium on Trial. I am Casey Seiler, Editor-in-Chief of The Times Union, and I am happy to be joined by... Jessica Marshall, Multimedia Producer and Producer of Nexium on Trial. And Rob Gavin, I am the Cops and Courts Reporter for The Times Union, and I cover the Nexium trial. And just to remind folks, we are talking about the second season of HBO's documentary series, The Vow, specifically the fourth episode titled The Breach. And this episode was really built around the story of Lauren Salzman as laid out in her fairly explosive testimony in the trial of Keith Raniere. And Rob, you were in the courtroom for that. So can you just kind of talk a little bit about the impact of Lauren Salzman's testimony, sort of where it fell in the prosecution yeah. case and the, the how it landed? Yeah, it was an afternoon and the buildup was very much something everybody was focused on because here is this star witness. She's going to be the big witness. And those witnesses... In a case, I'm not going to say it was a do or die for the federal government, but she's the most important witness, certainly at that point in the trial. And she gets up there and really walked people through ESP, Nexium, all of it, DOS, slowly, one by one by one. You know, Lauren comes in, and one of the early things that struck me, and I think it probably struck a lot of people there, was just how easy it is to commit an ethical breach when you are in the world of Keith Raniere. And in this case, Lauren Salzman made it clear that the number one thing for her, I mean, she cried on the witness stand while still talking about it. So it was something that obviously still uh, upset her, was that Keith Raniere had promised her that she was going to be able to have a baby with him. This is something Keith held over Lauren for years. And then she sort of roughhouses in a game of volleyball. And as you know, if you've been following the vow and if you know the world of Nexium, volleyball is huge in the world of Nexium. Late night volleyball games at the old sports barn, not far from uh, where many Nexium members lived in Half Moon. And just Lauren Salzman's quote unquote ethical uh, breach is that she roughhouses on a volleyball court. Flirts with a guy who is not Keith Raniere or basically sort of jumps on him in sort of a, a roughhousing style. Mm-hmm. And Keith's reaction is, whoa, you can't have my baby anymore. I mean, you want to talk about just complete, like, what the hell? That's what the reaction was. And I think, you know, he's someone who's known as being extremely manipulative. He expects total loyalty from the women he's involved with. And meanwhile, Keith is sleeping with more than 20 women in Nexium and some, at least one person who when the relationship, if you want to call it that, started was not a woman, was underage. And Keith is carrying on these relationships. So he he doesn't show any sort of effort to be loyal to any one of these women, but he expects every single one of them to be loyal to him, even to the extent of, we mentioned a witness last week, he wanted this woman and her husband to remain celibate for the first two years of their marriage. So Lauren, someone he had been involved with on and off, uh, since she was about 19 or 20 years old. And keep in mind, Keith, I don't know if they've made this clear in the vow. Keith and Nancy had a sexual uh, relationship as well. They were absolutely involved early on. So he's involved with Lauren's mother. Then he, he becomes involved with Lauren. Uh, Nancy says in last night's episode she didn't uh, know about it. But you know she knows what it's like to be involved with Keith Raniere. And being involved with Keith Raniere is he demands absolute loyalty and what he considers to be an act of crossing that loyalty, an act of betrayal, can be the smallest, tiny thing. And in this case, Lauren Salzman had the audacity to roughhouse with another man on the volleyball court. And that rendered an ethical breach. You know, at another time, which they get to, Keith waits until Lauren is very vulnerable again. He waits till he gets her into DOS. And only then, when she's made a lifetime commitment and given over collateral does he then uh, drop the the bomb of hey by the way i'm having a baby with this other woman it basically lays out in the case of lauren salzman a situation or a process in which renere went from kind of having these overlapping affairs with women in nexium first 
using kind of Baroque complex psychological controls and then with sort of the innovation, the rather dark innovation of DOS, the sorority within Nexium, uh, doing it through far more evil means, specifically through the use of, of collateral, which is essentially just blackmail material. Some of it fictional, some of it non-fictional. And I think there's a lot of, the term being used more and more often is uh, gaslighting. And there was an expert who talked about gaslighting uh, at the trial. And you see an example of that in this situation where Keith is, he basically makes Lauren right, that she's looking, quote unquote, easy by flirting. Meanwhile, you know, he's he's sleeping with the entire, with basically every woman he can possibly be involved with in Nexium. But he makes her write this seven point uh, bulletin, which says, I'm so sorry, Keith. I have not respected my relationship. I defaulted on my commitment and was not honest about what I was doing. So she also mentioned in that letter that, you know, she realizes that her behavior quote unquote behavior reflects poorly on Keith and the child that they have not even conceived yet. So she said something like, I'm hurting somebody that hasn't even been born yet. It just shows you how drawn in she was. And what was not shown is that when Lauren first testified, what's interesting is when she first met Keith Ranieri, when she's like 19 or 20, she yeah. said she thought he was quote unquote, a little strange and that she eventually warmed up to him and confided in him and ultimately they become uh, sexually involved and like her mother became subservient to, to Ranieri. But Lauren is one of these many people in Nexium who's pretty intelligent and early on their first impression is the right one. We see it with Mark Vicente. We see it with Lauren. We see it with uh, the woman we'll learn more about next week who was kept in a room. Their initial reaction is, Hey, something's not right about this, but they get sort of, sucked into it and in the case of lauren uh, salzman it also involves her mother so you're not just talking about a group you met and you liked and you joined this is her mother's involved her sister was involved this is a job she was 19 or 20. well one of the things that i found most interesting about this episode and something that i was hoping that it would address and i'm not sure it did a great job of it but was Nancy's reaction to her daughter's testimony and how Nancy, you know, reconciled her role in what ended up happening to her daughter. And, you know, through a series of, you know, coffee talk with Nancy chats throughout the episode, you, you get a little bit of an idea of how responsible she feels about what happened to her daughter and how she pulled her into Nexium. Yeah. And, and without a doubt, that is, it's tragic. Nancy is much more a collaborator or a perpetrator than a victim of Keith Ranieri. I think there's probably an element of that, but I think as the as the president of Nexium and prefect, she bears a heavy burden of responsibility for empowering and playing defense for Keith Ranieri for decades. But in the case of Lauren Salzman, you have somebody who is who is definitely kind of more or appears to be more victim than perpetrator, but she obviously is, is a perpetrator as well in the role that she played in bringing other women into DOS along with, uh, with other, you know, first line masters as they were referred to. But once again, I had a problem with Nancy Salzman's testimony or her interviews. That is. Coffee talk with Nancy. That's what yeah, I'm Coffee talk with Nancy because I'm just really wary of the idea that, oh, now that she's seen it happen up close and personal to her daughter, um, that now the, the, the scales are, are dropping from her eyes when, and I'll, I'll come back around to this again and again, there was abundant, really lucid reporting on Keith Ranieri and his mistreatment of women before uh, the fall of 2017, when DOS was was finally brought to light. And I am specifically referring to the 2012 Times Union series by Jim O'Dotto and Jennifer Gish called Secrets of Nexium, which, which offered the exact same type of behavior chapter and verse. And everybody within Nexium knew 
about those stories. Nancy Salzman knew about those stories and uh, her response, as, as far as we know, but we don't know from the vow because they never ask her about it. Mark Vicente in the first season was asked about it and he essentially said, I went to go talk to Keith and he explained it away. But at, at no point is, is Nancy confronted with that. We know that the, that series, those stories dropped on the Nexium community, you know, like an atomic bomb. And this whole like, oh, I, I just had no idea he was like this from Nancy is something that I find exceedingly hard to take. Yeah, and she knows yeah. from personal experience. I mean, Nancy Salzman was involved with Keith Raniere. She knows as well as anybody how controlling he is, how manipulative he is. It's just one of these situations in Nexium, in this case, where the lines between victim and abuser are a little blurred. In the case of Nancy, she is obviously with so much of the operation of Nexium, and she's the prefect. So more than anyone else other than Keith Raniere, she's going to be aware of those stories that ran in the Times Union. She's well aware of it. I think there was a reference in last night's episode where they joked around that as far as HR goes, her and her daughter were the HR people who, who you're going to go to. And one thing that definitely was true is that Nancy served a role in basically if women went to her, women that, she, that are coming to her for self-help. Because remember, Nexium is purportedly a personal improvement company. And you're going there to uh, better yourself. So you're talking to this person. You're opening up all your uh, secrets and, hey, this is what I what's happening. And, and meanwhile, the person you're telling this to is also working to benefit the person who's causing all this personal pain. And she's working to basically do PR for Keith while supposedly helping someone who's upset over Keith. And she knows very well all about that. I think it's hard to tell. I mean, because what she's saying is true. She did play that role. But you've also seen that uh, Nancy has, throughout the vow, has basically tried to kind of distance herself from the worst of Keith Raniere. And and the other thing to remember is that we talk about Das, and I've said this before, I'll say it again, many of the women in Das and the abuse that they took and the things they went through, sleep deprivation, being told, being, hey, how much do you weigh? Can you get down to this? Many women who were not in Das, they experienced that same sort of manipulation, abuse, shame from Keith Raniere as well. So he was doing a lot of those things, including one woman, the woman he was involved with when she was not a woman yet, when she was 15, he was calling her his quote unquote slave years before Das. So some of this stuff has been around for a while. Das just gave him a way to sort of really make it collateralized. I think in this episode, Nancy came close to showing some glimmer of contrition about the situation. I mean, she, there is a scene where she says she she confesses, I used my authority to edify Keith Raniere, and he took that credibility I gave him, and he abused many people. And she said, you know, that's my I don't know how to live with that. That's my cross to bear in life. She starts tearing up. I mean, there was a little bit of that. But then, you know, you juxtapose that with the scene, you know, a few scenes later where she's laughing about sex toys and saying that she had no idea even what BDSM stood for. It was it was just it kind of took that teensy bit of credibility that she built up and just wiped it away. Yeah, this isn't a zany, hey, crazy, wacky, you know, BDSME, let's have a little laugh here. That This is not a light moment involving DOS. This was, you know, talk of a sex a dungeon was a part of the cruelty of Keith, that, in which he wanted to punish women in DOS for their indiscretions. And, you know, we did see part of the world of DOS in that, among the things we didn't hear last night, you know, that he demanded the women not only be basically rail thin and on calories of less than 500 calories a day, but he wanted them to grow their um, their hair and their pelvic region to be a certain amount because that's what he believed in. He had his own theories on that. And, yeah. and the uh, dungeon, which was going to be on a place on uh, uh, Milltown uh, Drive, 
and it was a house on that street in Half Moon, and that was the DOS house. They bought that. They brought a cage into the basement. They were planning to hold their meetings there, and at the start of all the meetings, it was to show basically X-rated photos of themselves to uh, a Keith a Ranieri. So it, as one woman would later testify who had been in DOS, it was about as degrading as humanly possible, and it's being done under the supposed flag of, oh, this is women's empowerment. So the sex dungeon that Nancy is laughing about, oh, ha, ha, ha. I mean, it's not a zany, wacky, oh, my God, that's funny. This was uh, torture. This was Keith Raniere controlling women, including her daughter, because when uh, Lauren's on the witness stand and she talks about the cage, she's certainly not you know laughing about it. She's certainly, she had said, this is something that she didn't like, you know, or didn't want anything to uh, do with. And Lauren showed real fear in not wanting to be part of something and had mentioned that another first line master, that's one of the eight women in DOS answering directly to Ranieri, that he, he kicked her, he whipped her, he smacked her, you know, and, and he was physically violent. It's worth pointing out that basically one point of, of this episode is to note that the hypocrisy of Keith's position was just surpassing on every level and nobody called him on it. And for example, all of these women had to be rail thin. Keith himself was not exactly Mr. You know, six pack abs, you know, and I, not. <laughs> yeah. And I, which is, there's, there's that. I think that this episode, this episode, you know, relies too heavily on the emotional impact of Lauren's testimony, you know, the the parts of it that were truly tragic, you know, she wanted to have a baby and she couldn't. And I think that what you're talking about and the rest of it, you know, some of the more serious things that happened are completely buried in all of this, you know, the way they've presented it. Um, they don't even mention the fact that that Keith, you know, what you just said about Keith physically abusing the women, um, that's not even kind of addressed at all it is a very emotional situation. I mean, personally, as somebody who's born children, you know, like it hits home, but I just, I don't think that they went deep enough with it. Well, that they had to wear uh, chains to symbolize dog collars that they, yeah, they didn't touch any of that. I mean that, that, and, and they, they do quote uh, Moira uh, Penz of the lead uh, prosecutor talking about the branding and they show another tape of Allison Mack and Keith having that conversation about, how Keith clearly talks about how he thinks women should be uh, branded, but they were marked. And and uh, one of the victims uh, of Keith Renier, of Keith Renier had testified at his sentencing that when she was marked and she said he owned me, I was his. And it's a way of basically saying you're my uh, property. It's the ultimate. He's a committing literally the biggest, most egregious ethical breach that you probably Correct. could imagine if you play by his rules. And he yeah. says at one point. He, they say, oh, it's K-R, right? And then he says, oh, it's K-A-R. He corrects, he corrects the person to mention that his middle initial is in there. And I've said this for a long time. Initially, and this came out, initially we thought that the brand was a mixture of Keith Raniere and Allison Mack. I mean, in case anybody ever wondered about that, there is no, from what we know about Keith Raniere, there is no way in this world Keith Raniere would share the spot. Yeah, he's not going to share. He's not going to share credit, as it were. It's not happening. Yeah. Purely coincidental. But I mean, back to the, you know, to your point, like, he has committed the ultimate ethical breach himself, right? The end of the episode where Lauren's describing the situation in Mexico when the police showed up and arrested Keith, like, it's just kind of her coming to terms finally with, you know, the fact that Keith was the one committing. It's not, it's not me. It's you. I mean, and that line, I mean, that line was as powerful at trial as it was in the episode where she says they're in the Mexican fishing uh, village of Shakala and they're about to have the quote unquote commitment ceremony, which was a, an oral sex extravaganza in which all the top Nexium uh, masters were going to, you know, perform oral sex on, Keith uh, Ranieri, but that never happens because the police come in that day. And as Lauren is in the that residence with Keith, police come in and she gives herself up and she's basically like ready to like fight for Keith. There's four machine guns at her. She's ready her. to die for him. Yeah. And the line comes and she said this in trial and she said, I've it never occurred to me that I would choose Keith 
and Keith would choose Keith. And she says that because Keith Rainier is hiding in a closet. This guy who talks about ethical breaches when, when the, you know what, hit the fan and their loyalty was put out there. This guy who talks about being, you know, men are this way and women are this way. He's really like old fashioned and misogynistic terms of what he believes men should be and women should be. And what is he doing when the Mexican police show up? He's hiding in a closet. And that, that really was a powerful bit of testimony at trial. And, and it's and a little, at- it's a little bit late in the day <laughs> to, <laughs> for, for Lauren Salzman to, to recognize that, wow, I guess Keith doesn't have my best interests at heart. Um, but we, we've discussed on previous years ago, uh, episodes of, of this podcast, those recordings, you know, taken, taken a walk with Allison Mack talking about, what the initiation ceremony ought to be like and, you know, make sure the women say that, you know, they choose this so it seems like they weren't coerced. Now, Nikki Klein shows up in this episode briefly to kind of defend the branding and say, oh, come on, if men were doing this, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a big deal. And, you know, her, her long held line is that, well, this is just something that the women cooked up between themselves as a sisterhood. And, once again, the the problem with the vow occasionally is that they let these people go on, uh, at least uh, from what the audience sees, unquestioned. And when Nikki Klein says something like that, I kind of wanted to say, hey, can I play you some audio of Keith laying out exactly how the initiation ceremony should go? Because it, it just points up that this line is rather problematic, to put it lightly, you know? And there's a part which didn't come out in last night's episode. They do mention how he says it's going to be known. And there's that disturbing part of how there could be, we could impact a presidential election and there, you know, DOS can, I mean, he, there is that part of it where you're just like, what? But there's another part there where he says, and this, this was in his, in, in the testimony, it came out in the recording where he says, there's a certain democratic process of sorts talking about DOS, but then he adds, this is an order. This isn't a democracy. So, yeah, and he's he's talking about DAS. So to that line alone, this is an order, this isn't a democracy. Right there just takes away the, the, the notion that these are just a bunch of, you know, uh, women that are doing what lots of people have done in colleges or, or, or fraternities or sororities and getting tattoos. That's, that's, this wasn't their choice. And, and there was a, another, uh, victim impact statement that came out at one of the sentencings, I think it was Keith Raniere's sentencing, who said that when she wanted to not get the brand, her master said to her, you don't have a choice. So there's a lot of evidence that this is not what it was being portrayed as by Nexium, And that was shown by what we now know on tape, his own words. So there's a lot of evidence there that shows that um, despite the claims that this was a just a bunch of uh, women getting together for a quote unquote badass you know uh, group. There's you know ample testimony that DOS was not something that women entered and stayed in by a choice, and certainly uh, the uh, brandings. We know women do not want to, want to uh, do that. That was Keith Raniere's. That was his. That was his demands. So okay, we've got to we got to wrap this up. But I have one very quick question for the both of you: Why did Keith Raniere move to create DOS when he did? And what what year are we talking about? We're talking about what twenty fifteen? Two thousand fifteen is when Keith in, invents DOS. Any does anybody have any theory as to why it happened in twenty fifteen? I do. Uh, I it? think it has to do with the fact that Pamela Kafritz, who had been his most loyal supporter over the years, was uh, dying of cancer. And this was a way, and she was sort of his, a person that could sort of get women for him and keep people in, in line. This was a way to sort of have that situation when she was gone. And I think that's got a lot to do with it. I also think it has to do with the fact that Nexium, in its by nature, wanted information from people when they joined that they could then use against people. This was a way of just putting it out there. And what better way than just yeah. focus on women because Keith right. just wants sex. Jess, any theory? No, I think my 
guesses kind of line up with what Rob just said, really. I mean, I imagine that at that point, too, I mean, the situation that we'll hear about in the next episode, um, I imagine played into it as well, but I don't want to give that away. I would not disagree with uh, Rob, but I think another element of it is that by that point, uh, after all the coverage of Ranieri's behavior resulted in absolutely no response from local, state, federal authorities at that point, I think he just thought he could get away with anything. It's level right. up, right? Level up, exactly. All right, well, there you go. That might be a good title for this episode. Okay, well, thanks very much once again. I am Casey Seiler, Editor-in-Chief of The Times Union. Jessica Marshall, Multimedia Producer and Producer of Nexium on Trial. Rob Gavin, Cops Courts Reporter, who covered the Nexium trial. And we'll be back next week with another episode of Nexium on Trial, a Times Union podcast. It's been 15 years since 12-year-old Jalik Rainwalker vanished. His disappearance from rural upstate New York was ruled a probable child homicide. But no one has ever been charged, and his body has never been found. This is Rainwalker, the Lost Boy. I'm Jessica Marshall. And I'm Wendy Libertor. In this podcast from the Times Union, we'll take a deep dive into this mystery, the case of a missing child that has unsettled New York's capital region and beyond for more than a decade. Coming soon wherever you listen to podcasts.